Yeah, yeah, the same thing. Okay, so it seems like the only thing we can do okay, is well, still posting. Yeah, maybe we should speak. just uh, restart the Hangout because... Well, um, no, it's okay. It's live. Mine's, mine worked. No, it is. Okay. Okay, okay, awesome. Great, yeah, it's uh, so, on the Google Plus page, so we can start. Okay, Thomas, are you ready? I'm okay, ready. So let, me mute, let me mute first everybody. Let me mute everybody. Well, we can go around the table. All right, so should we get started? Okay. Welcome, ev welcome everyone. Um, sorry, we're a little bit late. We had some slight technical problems, but we're all ready now. We're very pleased to have Thomas Roswas from MIT uh, to talk today. So before uh, we introduce the speaker and the talk gets underway, uh, maybe we can quickly go around the table so that each of the groups, uh, to introduce each of the groups. And India, do you want to do that? And India, I think you're muted. Yeah, so first we have the girl from University of Michigan. Hello. Hey, guys. <laughs> then we have TTI Chicago. Uh, hi. Couple more people here, but I can't really show you. Okay. Uh, then we have the girl from San Diego. Uh, we can't hear you, but uh, <laughs> okay, we can see many hands. <laughs> Uh, then we have the first of three Thomases involved in this hangout, Thomas Hollenstein. Hello. Hey, the group from Media Zirk. And uh, I guess those are all the groups. So I I'll mute myself. Yeah, no. yeah, I should also say hi. Uh, oh, Oded oh, 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 is uh, de facto always present, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but me, this is me in Oded's office. <laughs> okay, let's start the hangout. Let's start the talk now. All right. Um, before we start, let me announce the next speaker. So Jelani Nelson will be speaking on, um, I believe this is June 12th, which is the week uh, after stock. Um, so that will be our next talk. And we're planning to continue uh, on having speakers during the summer, depending on you know how much interest there is. So today we have Thomas Rosbos uh, from MIT. Thomas obtained his uh, PhD from uh, EPFL in 2009. And he's worked on a variety of problems, uh, most notably uh, obtained a lot of uh, uh, very nice approximation algorithms, including uh, approximation algorithm for the Steiner T3 problem, which was awarded the best paper award uh, at stock in 2010. So today Thomas will uh, tell us about a new approximation algorithm, this time for the bin packing uh, Problem. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, well, for inviting me uh, to my office to give uh, this uh, talk. Uh, I hope this is not getting a disaster. I'm not very tech savvy, but uh, <laughs> let's see how it goes. Okay, so I want to talk about my one of my favorite problems, with, which is uh, the bin packing problem. Um, so you probably remember that the input for bin packing consists just uh, of a sequence of numbers, S1 to Sn. So they're all numbers between 0 and 1. And the goal is to assign those items to minimum number of bins. And each of the bins has a capacity of 1 as well. So in other words, you have some numbers between 0 and 1. And you want to partition them uh, into sets so that each set has a size at most 1, sums up to at most 1. Um, um, so th this was among the, the first problems that was proven to be MP hard already uh, back in the 70s. In fact, it's, you probably remember that it's, it's MP hard to distinguish the cases uh, whether two bins are sufficient or whether three bins are needed. Um, actually, bin packing is also a good case study if you look at the development of approximation algorithms. So uh, in, the, in the 70s, Johnson started to analyze a couple of uh, simple um, 
uh, simple greedy algorithms like first fit, first fit decreasing, and so on. And they all, they all give some kind of reasonable constant factor approximations. Um, the, then actually the next step was done by uh, De La Vega and Luker. They found what is called an asymptotic uh, PTAS, which means that uh, they get a, a solution which is a 1 plus epsilon factor away from the optimum, well, plus some term. Um, so then the next big leap forward was actually done by Kamakar and Karp, and they showed that you can compute a solution in polynomial time which is only a log square opt factor away from the optimal. Um, in other words, this means that if your if your instances grow, then this approximation ratio will turn to one will tend to one. So this is also called an, an asymptotic FP does. Um, if you don't like that the opt appears in in the approximation, you can also uh, you can also put an N there. Just having the opt is, is kind of stronger because opt is, is always less than one. Um, at the moment, I'm looking to Thomas Vidig. So if you uh, if you want to nod, if you if you agree, and you you shake okay. your head. Uh, if you okay. disagree, then this helps. I think. I'll be expressive. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. So this this last algorithm by Kamar and Karp, it's from the early '80s, and this is actually the the state. This was the state of the art until very recently. Um, let me let me just describe how actually the last two approximation algorithms were done. Um, they were based on a very strong linear programming relaxation, which is also called the Gilmore-Gomori LP relaxation. And in fact, this the study of this LP goes back at least to the 50s. Uh, so there was some management paper in the 50s. So this is really very very classical LP. Um, it will actually be useful to imagine the following that if you have some items and they have the same they happen to have the same size then you could kind of group them together to sort of to to consider them as one item and think that they have some kind of multiplicity and let's say that uh, bi is the multiplicity of uh, of the item i which is size si okay now let me define a notion which is called a pattern a pattern is just uh, it's a vector in n dimensions, which represents a multi set of items that you can assign to one bin. So it's it's just okay. It's it's a vector so that if you sum up the entries with with the item size, this sums up to, to at most one. So this gives you one way how you can how you can pick one a single bin. Okay. And uh, then the LP is as follows: you have some variable x p for every pattern. And XP tells you how many patterns, how many bins do you actually want to pack according to this pattern. Um, okay, so the, the objective function is simply you want to minimize the number of bins that uh, that you're using, and um, you have this constraint that for every item, well, you have b many copies that you need to, need to get rid of, and the left hand side tells you how many slots you're actually reserving for that. Can you, by the way, see my cursor if I move it around, or? Yes, we can see it. It's, okay. a, it's a little bit small. Um, okay. We can definitely see it from inside the Hangout. I think people on the outside should also be able to see it. Okay. okay. Good. Um, now, this LP is, uh, is very strong in the sense that um, there's no integrality gap example which is larger than a plus 2. Uh, yeah. Um, now, there's a, a different way to formalize this uh, this linear program. I could write it in matrix form, and then my my left hand side constraint matrix I can call it just A, and well the right hand side vector is B. Okay. This is still the same LP, just in matrix form. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll show an example in a minute uh, because this is this is crucial that you know this is that's the okay. Um, now you see that. We have an exponential number of variables, so it's it's not a priori clear whether this could be solved in polynomial time. Mm, however, you can at least solve the LP up to any any precision that you like in polynomial time. Uh, well, this is essentially a set cover problem, so you can use uh, one of these frameworks like a multiplicative weight update method or the um, Plotkin-Schwarz-Stardorf framework. 
Um, the classical way how you solve this is actually using the, a variant of the aleatoid method. Yeah, but um, I don't. Sorry. Thomas, uh, can I ask? Uh, I imagine this is something you want to do later, but at this point, it seems um, unnecessary to deal with. To is, so we can assume without lot of generality that there's only one item of each size, right? We just slightly perturb the SI, so it cannot change the answer, right? Oh, oh, of course, of course. You're, you're absolutely right. At the beginning, However, later, we'll massage the instance, so we'll group items a little bit together, and even if you started with items that have, have all different sizes, in the, uh, during the algorithm, you will actually have, uh, have grouped your items together so that, that you have many copies of the same item size. OK. Any more questions? OK. Um, now, let me show you the, the promised example. Uh, now, this is our little input example. Um, and then this is our linear program. And so we have this big matrix A, this big constraint matrix. And uh, please remember that every column of this constraint matrix corresponds to one way how you can pack a bin, and every row corresponds to one item, which may or may not have many copies. OK. And, um, so this would be an example fraction solution. You, so you could buy one half times this pattern and one half times the second pattern and one half times the third pattern. And then you would have a solution uh, with a fraction value 1.5. And we saw that what well, the optimum has to be at least two. So you see that there is some gap, even if it is very small. Okay. So again, the linear program says essentially you, you want to select columns of this matrix to cover the right-hand side. OK. Um, good. And we will use this linear, linear program uh, to extract an integral solution, which is actually very close to the optimal. OK. Now, the, the algorithm of Kamaka and Karp, it's, uh, it's actually based on, on a trick that has been used uh, hundreds of times in theoretical computer science, and especially in the field of approximation algorithms. Um, use the good old trick that if you have some constraint system with uh, some linear constraint system with n equations, then you can always find a fraction solution, which is the basic solution, and this basic solution has a support of, at most, the number of constraints that you have. And geometrically, this is, this is just by, by picking an, an extreme point to, to the underlying polytope. Uh, now, this is a very useful trick. However, now we, we saw 30 years of no improvement. So I, I believe it's more or less safe to say that this technique for bin packing is probably too weak to give you any, any stronger bond. Uh, nevertheless, what we're going to see in this talk is an, a polynomial time algorithm that needs at most uh, log opt times log log opt bins more than the optimum. So in other words, the, the additive gap that we get is essentially the square root of the old gap. Um, and the way how we get this is we're using uh, techniques from one of my favorite areas of discrete math, which is called the discrepancy theory. Okay. Um, this one little technicality. Uh, there are some standard arguments that show that instead of showing this bound in terms of opts, I can show you the, the bound in terms of n, where n is the number of different item types. And I can also assume that the items are not super tiny, so they are at least 1 over n. Now, hi, these are essentially standard arguments that, that more or less already appeared in Kamaka Karp. Just that uh, you take your, your initial instance and you, 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 for a moment, you forget the tiny items. You just add the, the very tiny items later. And then you do one kind of a grouping, and this will reduce the number of different item sizes uh, so that it's of order out. OK. So, OK, um, let me explain you a little bit about discrepancy theory, just to give you a little bit of, the, of a background. Um, OK, the usual setting in discrepancy theory is that you have some finite set system or some, some ground set of elements. And 
what you want to do is you want to color your elements. And you want to color them with two colors, let's say red or blue, or minus one and plus one, so that the maximum imbalance is minimized. And the imbalance of a set, it's the difference between red and blue elements that you have in that set. Um, so formally, this is, this is the discrepancy, but uh, don't worry, you don't, you don't need to learn this. This is uh, not going to appear later. Um, so, for example, if you have n arbitrary uh, sets over n elements, uh, this is probably a, the most natural setting. Then there's a celebrated result of uh, Joel Spencer, which says that um, you can always find a coloring with the discrepancy of root n. Um, and if you now start calculating in your head, what would be a, what would a random coloring give? Then a random coloring would need an extra root log n factor. So this is better than just a random coloring. Um, some more results uh, that I like a lot is, for example, the, the one of Beck-Viala, which is that if the frequency is low, so every element is in at most t sets, then you can get a bound which is only linearly depends on, on that frequency. So it doesn't depend on the size of your set system at all. Um, in fact, the, the authors also conjecture that the correct dependence should be root t, which is kind of, uh, would kind of uh, unify uh, the, the last bounds that I, that I cited. Uh, but it seems that at the moment nobody has any idea to get anything better than, than order t in this case. Um, so essentially the standard technique in this field, it's called uh, the entropy method, or also called the partial coloring method. Now, Initially, this technique worked as follows. Um, you argue that there are exponentially many colorings. So probably you will also have two co many colorings that differ in many coordinates, but still their impact on the set is actually very similar. So and then you take the difference of, uh, of two of those colorings, and you, you actually you get a partial coloring, which is very good. Now, this argument goes, uses the pigeonhole principle with exponentially many pigeons and exponentially many pigeonholes. So this was initially a non-constructive technique. Uh, however, just uh, um, two or three years ago, Nikhil Banzal managed to actually make this constructive. And uh, there was also an even more recent beautiful result of, uh, of Lava and Meka, and they uh, they give somewhat a more natural algorithm to, to actually find these partial colorings. Um, okay. And especially the last, last result of Lavin and Mega, it fits precisely with what we need. So I would like to show you, um, show you what they have done. And as one of the authors is, uh, is listening, I have to be very careful that I'm not lying. Um, okay. So the algorithm of Lavin and Mega works as follows. Imagine you have, you have a hypercube, an n-dimensional hypercube, and you, you have some fractional vector x sitting in that hypercube. And um, you have a polytope, which is defined by some unit normal vectors vi, and it's also defined by this, the distance lambda i from your point x to the, to the hyperplane. Okay, so this nicely defines your polytope. And what we would li like to have is a point like this y that you see in the picture. So it's a, it's a vector that's also, that's still in the polytope, but that has the nice property that at least half of the coordinates are integral. So at least half of the coordinates are either 0 or 1. Okay. So obviously you need some kind of condition on your polytope so that this y exists at all. And the condition is as follows. So if you sum over all your hyperplanes and you sum up e to minus the square distance, then you should get something which is significantly smaller than the dimension of your polytope. Okay. And if this is satisfied, well, it's actually, this is not trivial at all that there exists even such a y. But however, Lava and Mika, they show that you can, they, you can also find this y in polynomial time. 
So let me just briefly sketch uh, how the algorithm works. Uh, so you just you start a Brownian motion at x. Uh, so you have a Brownian motion through your polytope. And OK, so well, we are walking through our polytope. And at some point, you, we're probably going to hit one of our hyperplanes. And if that happens, then we continue the Brownian motion in the subspace spanned by this hyperplane. So we're continuing. Uh, we're going to continue our Brownian motion, and then probably we're going to hit more hyperplanes. Then we stay in the intersection of those hyperplanes, and so on. And after a fixed number of, uh, after a fixed time interval, you, you stop the algorithm, and you say, wherever I'm now, this is my y. Now, why should this actually be have the property that I mean? This is obviously still in the polytope, but why does this y satisfy that? Um, probably half of the, um, the indices are 0 or 1. Mm, well, now first of all, let's look at one of the hyperplanes i, uh, uh, which is, is a distance lambda i from the starting point. And you design the Brownian motion so that it has a, only a constant standard deviation in every direction. Now if you have a constant standard deviation in the direction of the hyperplane, then it's actually exponentially unlikely that you're ever going to reach that hyperplane by using your, your favorite martingale consideration inequality. Um, OK. And now if you, if you look at the condition that we have uh, for the existence of such a y, then we understand this now better. The condition simply says that the expected number of hyperplanes that you're going to hit should be just a small fraction of the dimension. Okay, and now if you if essentially if you carefully compare the expectations, then then you get the result. So this is very really a beautiful paper, and I can really recommend to read it. It's it's, it's very clean and nice. Uh, Thomas, just uh, mm -hmm. just a very stupid comment. Just uh, in your uh, picture, it's a bit misleading because typically the um, the y is so the lambda is going to be big, so the you know the hyperplanes are going to be somewhat far and and. The, the, the box yeah, is somewhat closer. Yeah, it's hard to do yeah. in two dimensions. In two right? dimensions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a high dimensional phenomenon that usually the hyperplanes are very far away. I mean, you, most hyperplanes would be further away than the coordinate hyperplanes. So, yeah, which in two dimensions is not, yeah, not really the case. Okay. Uh, thanks, one. Uh, okay. Now, this is the tool that we're going to use. And I hope you can see that this tool is really made for LP rounding. Because this is precisely the problem we have in LP rounding. We have some fractional vector x, and we want to get an integral solution. Well, this gives us at least a half integral solution. Um, and what we can do is we can add some kind of linear constraints. And uh, we know that these linear constraints will be satisfied up to some error that we can actually choose a priori. OK. Now, in other words, we have some kind of a budget which is of order the dimension. And I can, I can add linear constraints. And if I want that the, the linear constraint is exactly preserved, then I choose the lambda to be 0. And then in the budget, I pay 1. And if I say that, well, I have this linear constraint. And if it's a little bit violated, this is fine. So I can choose the lambda higher then actually the contribution to the budget is actually going down exponentially in the error that I'm allowing. OK. So I hope you see that this is going to be a very useful tool, and uh, we're going to use this. Okay. Um, yeah. So far, I, I said that the, the vectors vi are unit vectors. Well, obviously, if they are not unit vectors, then it's kind of uh, the Euclidean length is going, uh, you need to factor it into the, the approximation error that you have. OK. Now, this gives us actually the first idea for an approximation algorithm for bin packing. OK, this is somewhat the obvious way how you might start is you compute some near optimum fraction solution x to, your, uh, to the Gilmore Gomori LP. And then, then you run the partial coloring lemma. Well, you need to run it for log n iterations until uh, your solution is integral. Well, in, in, in each iteration, well, half of the half of the variables are going to be integral. Okay. 
Uh, is this is it clear what we're doing? So, okay, you you start with x, you give it to the partial coloring lemma, you get you get back a y where at least half of the variables are integral. Then you take this y and you take the fractional part and you you give it again to the to the partial coloring lemma and you get you get again a new new vector where again half of that half of the variables is integral and then you just you just continue this for logging. Okay. Now, okay. So the next question should be: How exactly do we apply this partial coloring lemma? How should we choose this vi's? How should we choose this parameters lambda i? Now let's think a little bit about that. Uh, okay. So what are the properties that y should actually satisfy? Now let's say that this is our initial input instance, um, and x is a fraction solution for that. And now let's say we run the partial coloring lemma, and then this is the vector a y. In other words, this is these are the slots which the the rounded vector y reserves. Well, these numbers could even be fractional, but let's let's not think about that. So the question is: Is this a solution for my initial input instance? Um, you see that for some items I have actually more copies than I need. For some items I don't have any copy. But it might still actually be a, be a valid solution because uh, let's look at the following curve. Now, Rick, you, hopefully, you, you hopefully see that we, we sorted the items according to their sizes, starting with the largest one. And the curve now gives the following. It gives you the number of slots which y reserves for the i largest items minus the number of copies that you have for the i largest items. Okay. Now you see that this curve is positive, is not negative for all i. And then it's actually not difficult to see that if you have this, then you can find a mapping of your input items to slots, slots which are reserved by y. Simply by mapping items to to slots of maybe larger items. Thomas, yeah? just one thing that confused me a bit, and I think I understand what uh, what the figure shows now. I mean, you're not showing the bins. What you're showing is simply the items and how many times. Absolutely. Each item. Okay. Absolutely. No bins here. Okay. I do not show any bin. This is just um, what. How many copies do I have initially? Now I do some rounding, and now how many slots do I have at the end? Okay. And another thing is that the y's, um, uh, each coordinate of the y indicates whether you take or not take a certain configuration of, of a bin, right? Absolutely correct, yes. Okay, okay thanks. One more question. Uh, sorry. Just to follow up on Oded's uh, question. So the, the vector now is exponential size, right? So uh, the, the fractional solution or the number of coordinates in the fractional solution is exponential. Okay. So okay. the number of iterations you need is not log n, but uh, log of the number of coordinates. Ah, good, good observation. In fact, so first of all, all the algorithms that you run, they run in polynomial time, so they obviously do do will not give you exponentially many configurations. Uh, you can actually even clean this up at the very beginning by you can just start the whole process with a basic solution. And then, uh, in the basic solution, you're never using more configurations as you actually have different item types. But this is, yeah, yeah this is a technical idea you need to set up. But see, how can you run a random walk bound in motion in exponential dimension? Yeah, I mean, you, you reduce everything initially. I mean, you, you start the whole algorithm with not more configurations as you actually have item types. And then everything is is nice. Okay. Okay. So this is this is a y that um, that we would like to find. So that this this kind of this curve, the, this number of slots for the i largest items minus the number of copies that you have for the i largest items. Now this is always positive. Uh, well, actually, but 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 what happens when, if it's not? So what happens if this curve also goes below zero? Well, that's not really a problem. If we, let's say, this curve is always at most k items away from the x, uh, from, from the axis, from, from, from zero, then 
when, then we know that um, we, we might lose k items. We might need to throw away k items, but we can actually assign the rest. OK. And this is precisely what we're doing. We'll start with a fraction solution x. Then we'll compute a less fraction solution y, which has the same cost, the same cost as x. And we will show that the de this, this curve is actually always very close to, uh, to 0. OK, it will never be far away from 0. OK, good. So it, it essentially means we're, we're going to buy the right number of slots that we need. OK. Now, one quantity that's actually important is, is the one that you see in the lower left corner is the sum over j at most 1, a j times y minus x. Now, let me explain this, uh, this formula a little bit. This is actually this curve. Uh, now, a j is the jth row of a, OK? And now, a j times x, this is how many copies I have for the jth item in my input. And a j times y, this is how many slots the solution y reserves, OK? Uh, and now this, OK, and now you sum this up over all items j that are smaller than i, and then you get precisely this curve. So this, this, this quantity on the left-hand side, we want that this is, we want to find a y such that this quantity is small for every j. OK, that's the goal. And then we're in business. So this is a product of a row vector by column vector? Correct, yes. Okay. Yes. OK, now. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, right, so your solution is, is this method is always going to be in the support of your uh, base fractional solution. Right? So you're not even going to get outside the support of the base fractional solution. Correct. Started with. Correct. What are, so what, what, are, what is known about the limitations of such a technique? Like, could this get better than overflow? Or, so what do we know? OK, OK. Um... OK, at the moment, we are kind of not going out of the support. Uh, later, we'll introduce a little trick. But if you only would select uh, patterns that are in your initial support, then you could not beat log square n. There's no way to beat log square n. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a little trap. We'll run into that later, and then we'll see how to get around that. OK. What we'll essentially do later is we will take, we'll take patterns in our initial support, and then we'll use them to kind of construct new ones. And it's in an implicit way, actually. OK. OK, maybe, maybe we, we go on for the moment. OK. Now, um, OK. Now, this is actually the main, the main proof slide. Um, so this is our big matrix A, and you remember that we have a column for every configuration, every pattern, and we have a row for every item. And uh, OK. So we're, we're starting with a, with a vector x, and we want to find a vector y such that, um, well, for every i, this, uh, this partial sum is actually small. OK. By the way, if you like discrepancy theory, then this is also called a, a linear discrepancy problem. And uh, now for the moment, let's for the sake of simplicity assume that all the items, uh, they have size within a factor of 2. Let's say they are between 1 over k and 2 over k. Now, essentially, well, we have log n of these kind of size classes. And whatever error we're getting now, we have to multiply it with log n. And then actually, we also have to, to multiply it with, with log n iterations that we're going to need. So. Whatever error we're getting now, it should be, be it should be better sub constant if we want to make an improvement. Okay. Now I I have to be, to tell you how I want to choose this vectors v i, and uh, that that I want to give to the Lovett make algorithm, and um, I'm going to do that as follows. I will take an interval of the rows, and please remember that this corresponds to a consecutive set of items, and the items are sorted to the, according to their sizes. And then I will just sum up the rows. And this gives me vector vi. 
And these are the vectors that I'm going to use. Okay. Now what this intuitively tells us is that I am I look at a, at a group of consecutive items and I want that uh, the new solution Y reserves roughly the same number of items for this group as, uh, as my initial solution X. Okay. Whereby I'm not distinguishing items within the same group. Okay. Now the next question is how, which, which intervals am I going to take? Uh, okay. This is not so difficult. Uh, I'm going to partition the rows or the items um, into into intervals, and I call these intervals groups, so that every group con accounts for roughly 100k incidences in the matrix. So I want that these vectors, these v v vectors that I get, they, they should have a one norm of roughly some constant times k, some big constant times k. Okay. Good. Um, now I take these vectors and uh, I throw them into a Lovett maker. And as I don't have any other idea how to choose the lambdas, I just choose them as zero. And it, so I, I say I don't want any error, and I just I just see what I get. Okay. Just just to make you clear what ha what's going on, this is equivalent to doing the following. This is equivalent to taking your matrix A, then you take columns together so that you get 100k incidences, then you kind of, you group these items together, and you, then you compute the basic solution. So this is essentially the same what we're doing at the moment. Okay. Now, if you, if you go back to the curve, then what we're doing at the moment just says that uh, essentially, every 100k incidences, my curve should be at zero. And that's not a bad thing, because if every 100k incidences, your curve is at zero, then in the middle, it, it cannot go arbitrarily far away. In fact, it cannot go further away than 100k. Okay. Uh, let me make this more formal. Um, well, first of all, we should uh, not forget that there is this kind of this entropy condition that has to be satisfied for um, for the Lovett maker algorithm to actually be applicable. Let's just uh, quickly check this. As we are only using lambdas that are zero, so these arrows that are they, they are zero, um, we only need to, to verify that the number of groups that we are actually picking, so the number of intervals that we are actually picking, that this is only a small fraction of the dimension. The dimension of the polytope, which in this case is the number of columns of my matrix A. So this is the number of configurations that I still have. Okay. Now, but my matrix A, it is column sparse. It means if you sum up, uh, if you sum up a column of the matrix, this this is just the number of of items that you have in one uh, in one pattern. And the items have size at least one over k. You cannot have more than k of them, so the column sum is at most k. Now the column sum is at most k, and every of my groups consumes 100 k incidences. So obviously, uh, the number of groups that I'm having is only a very small fraction of of the number of columns. And this is the, the, that's it. So the Lovett maker algorithm is applicable, and it will give me a solution. Okay. Now, um, what I want to argue next is what I already did a bit hand-waving, that actually the curve, this curve that I showed you, it's never going to be further away from the axis than 100k. Um, okay, now formally, let, let's pick your favorite in, um, item i, and okay, let's look at the, the interval from 1 to i, so the first i, uh, the largest i items, and now you sum up, um, you sum up this a j times the difference of x minus y. So what this essentially means is that you sum up the first i rows of your matrix, and then you look at the difference, you look at the, the scalar product with x minus y. Now let's write the interval from one to i. We can also write this as a disjoint union of intervals, um, as follows: we take a disjoint union of groups um, plus, well, there will be a part 
Okay, we will get many, probably many groups in that interval that are fully contained, plus there will be one group which is only partially contained. Okay. Now, we can actually split this sum, and then we get that, um, okay, it's kind of the contribution for every group that's fully contained to this, uh, to this arrow will be zero, because this is, this is the guarantee which the love and make algorithm gives us. So the only error that we're paying is for the group that was only partially contained in the interval between 1 and i. And then we know that, well, uh, that could be at most 100k. I mean, this is essentially the error that, that you get if the x goes everywhere from 0 to 1 or so. Okay. So we get an error of at most 100k. Uh, in the picture that you saw before, it, it just says that the, the curve is never going to be larger than 100k in absolute value. And now you will wonder, 100k, is this a good value? Is this a bad value? Well, we have items that have size roughly 1 over k, and there will be 100k items that we need to throw away. So there will be some constant number of bins that we need. Uh, this is like the arrow that we need to pay. But I told you that we, we should better get a sub-constant error if you want to improve, because we have log n of the size classes, and we need to run this for log n iterations. So at the moment, this looks like um, we're not getting anything better than, than log square n. OK. Now, the point is that we haven't used the full power of, of the entropy method, because we have only used the error bounds that are 0. And that we could have easily gotten also with just computing the basic solution. Okay, so now we want to use now we want to use the, the tricks. Okay. Now, the point is that if you look at the curve, then uh, we know that every 100k incidences we're back at zero, but we don't have any control how the curve behaves in between. In other words, we do not know we cannot control the coverage of items within a group. We know that for every group itself, we have the right number of slots but we do not know how the coverage is within the group. So we kind of, we want to add a couple of finer vectors to get some, some kind of fine, we want to refine the argument a little bit. Now let's take, let's take each of the groups that we have and let's just, uh, let's partition it into a polylogarithmic number of subgroups. And um, more precisely, I want log square n many um, prefixes. Okay, so I take, I take one big group, and now I look at prefixes of this group, and I take actually log square n of these prefixes, so that, that the growth is essentially the same. Okay. Now, these prefixes, they define, again, intervals, so they again define these vectors, the, the s in this case, and I can, again, throw them into the lab and make an algorithm. Well, I did have a bit of slack for this entropy condition, but I need to, uh, I need to be careful that I, I'm not using more than, than just this slack. Okay. Now, the point is I cannot use the, an error of zero for these uh, subgroup vectors because my budget is not large enough for that. So I have to accept a larger error. Uh, and you, you can make a calculation. Some error of, say, log, log, n would be fine. But this error is not really crucial. Uh, by the way, this is not the log log n that, that, was, that appeared in the title. This is a different log log n. Okay. Good. Okay. Thomas, can, can you please just remind me how you define uh, vg, or in this case, vs? Okay. Uh, g is an interval of rows. And vg, it, you get it by summing up the rows in that interval. Great. Okay, this was what I thought. Quick. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, okay, well, what I wrote uh, in, in, in the line that starts with input y, this is the, the, the guarantee which the Lovett Maker algorithm gives us. And now, now let's, see, let's see what we get from that. Okay, now again, we have to look at an interval from 1 to i, so at the, the largest i items. And uh, okay, again, we can write the interval from 1 to i as disjoint union of a couple of groups that are fully contained, plus one subgroup that's fully contained, plus some rest. Okay. Some some small remaining. 
Okay. Now again, the contribution from the groups that are fully contained, that was zero. Okay. So we are not going to change anything here. Um, now, this remaining interval that we have, this is now going to be very, very small. This is only a 1 over log square n factor of what it was before. So obviously, here we get a very small error, and we can actually ignore this error. The crucial contribution is, what's the error that we get from the subgroup? Okay, so what is the scalar product of the subgroup vector with the change x minus y? Well, the lovett Meka algorithm tells us that this, the error of that is essentially proportional to the Euclidean norm of that vector. Well, times this, the error that we have chosen, times the log log n vector. But again, we will see that the log log n is actually very small, so we can, we can kind, of, kind of ignore the log log n error. So just, just, just think of the Euclidean length of this vector. So you have a subgroup meaning it's an interval of items, and then you sum up the rows, and then you think, what is the Euclidean norm? What is the L2 norm of this, of the vector that you get? This is essentially the error that we'll have. OK. Now, I'm personally not a big fan of, of the L2 norm, essentially, because we don't know much about this at the moment. So let's just rewrite the L2 norm in terms of the, of the L1 norm. The L1 norm is a nice norm because, uh, the L1 norm just says how many incidences do I have in the matrix in that interval, and this is precisely how I defined the interval. So I know that this is at most 100k. Okay. So this is at most or okay. Uh, yeah. But here, I got uh, I got a strange factor in front, which is, which you, I mean, this is essentially a trivial case of Hilda's inequality, but this is. Uh, you have the square root of the ratio of the infinity norm over the one norm. So what this essentially, this ratio, it's, uh, okay, you sum up the, the rows in your, in your subgroup and you look at what's the difference between all incidences and the incidence that you get in one column. Okay. And now we wonder, well, how large could that be? Well, obviously, the infinity norm is always uh, at most the one norm, so we could up upon this by one. Fine. But then we get an error which is again of order k. Uh, so again, we would lose a constant number of bins, and then we have again the con uh, log n many item, uh, kind of item classes, size classes, and log n iterations. So we would again end up with, with a log square n uh, approximation error. And again, we would not improve. Okay. But you would say that typically, if you have, I mean, if you have a random vector, then the one norm is, is going to be much larger than the infinity norm. So this looks like a pathological case. And uh, maybe, maybe this case doesn't happen. Mm, well, unfortunately, it could happen. Uh, if, you, if you look at the matrix, uh, something changed. And this, this shows essentially the case when this ratio of infinity norm over one norm could be large, say, a constant fraction or something. So maybe I'm missing something, but is there any reason, is there any, uh, are you forced to order the rows in this way? Can, can't you permute the rows randomly? Oh, I could, I could, but then if they are not sorted according to their size, then it's kind of, you have a problem, then, then you try to, to map a large item into the slot of a small item, so... All right, I mean, the whole definition of this uh, sum AJ, this is meant to capture what happens when they decrease in size, otherwise you don't necessarily yes. know. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay, now, okay. By the way, uh, if you wonder why the two norm appears here, the two norm is essentially the standard deviation of a random variable which you have in the Lovett Mika algorithm. So this essentially says that you have some standard deviation, could it be large? And you see in this picture, yeah, maybe it could. It could be that you have some of the subgroups and uh, essentially all the incidences, they appear in, in one of the, your configurations. Let me be. Let me be more clear. What it means. The 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 only 
really pathological case in which we cannot immediately improve over karma and, and karma kind carb is the following that you see here in the picture. It's that you have some pattern in your fraction solution, and let's say you have uh, many, many, many copies of the same item or very similar item sizes, and let's say they, they occupy a constant fraction of your of your, your pattern. But well, this, this could happen. So, okay. So, if we want to make an improvement, we, we kind of need to get rid of this nasty case. In fact, here comes the trick. We're going to massage our instance a little bit. Now, um, let's imagine that in the, in the lower half of the picture, you see our input, so some items, and we have, well, certain numbers of copies of that. And in the upper half, you see, uh, you see a fraction solution. You see configurations that are used in the fraction solution. And let's say we actually, we do have this path pathological case. Mm. For the sake of simplicity, let's say we have some pattern and the fraction value is 1 over Q for some integer Q. And let's say we indeed, we have many, many, many copies of the same item in this pattern. Let's say K times Q. Um, okay, but what this means is that this particular pattern alone covers already K items K copies of this item I in my input. So if you look at this matrix formulation AX equals B, it means that this particular column covers some integer number of time, some integer number on the right hand side. Uh, okay. Now what I do now is I take these K items that are covered just by that pattern, and I glue them together. So I get a new item. I get a new artificial item, which did, this type did not exist before, and the size is just, uh, well, the sum of the items that I glue together. And I also make a replacement in my fracture solution. OK. What I'm essentially, OK. Now, uh, this essentially means I'm restricting myself. I see that in my fractional solution, an, uh, an item appears many, many times. I mean, many, many copies appear of the same items. And then I glue them together. It means I restrict myself and I force myself that no matter what happens later, these copies are going to appear in the same bin in my final solution. It doesn't seem to be very smart to restrict ourselves, but this is the, the key idea. Okay. okay. Now, is it equivalent to saying that your V is now an R in some coordinates and a sum in some other coordinates? Instead of just being a sum everywhere, there's, there's a lot of coordinates where you were stacking up a lot of entries, you just took the R instead of having a sum. I'm taking the R? I mean, uh, uh, well, the entry in the corresponding coordinate for V is now just one instead of the sum of all the entries. But uh, you're using um, to analyze because you're only saying you will group those items. What happens in the matrix, if you look at the matrix, what happens is that you have some large, large entry and you're moving that entry kind of upwards and then it's a small entry. It's a small entry but it belongs to a larger item. Mm -hmm. Now, um, okay. Now let me first argue why we're not doing any harm at this point. Um, okay. Now I have modified my input instance and I have modified my fractional solution, but still the new fractional solution that I have is a fractional solution for my modified input. Moreover, it's a feasible one. I haven't changed the objective function. I'm, I'm still using exactly the same number of, of, of patterns. Uh, and the most important thing is that if I manage to find a solution for my modified input, then I will have this big item, and it will be somewhere. It will have a slot somewhere. And then I can remember, then I can go back, and I can remember that, no, I didn't 
didn't have that artificial item. I did have k smaller items, but I can put them precisely into that slot. OK, so I haven't done any harm. Okay. The only thing is that I need to convince you that this has been useful. OK. OK. Now, what I've done at the moment was I glued um, copies of one item in one pattern. Now, obviously, the next step is to apply this globally to my whole fraction solution whenever this is possible. Okay. Now, this is going to. This is uh, what I'm going to do now. Um, this looks maybe a little technical, but it's actually not very complicated. It's, it's a half a page proof in the paper. Okay. Now let's look at the following picture. Let's imagine that this is my matrix A, and on the right hand side, this B. This is just how many copies do I have in my input. And the items are sorted, so kind of higher rows mean larger. larger uh, Thomas, can you just remind us, are you including all the items in all scales, or just 1 over k? Or is there everything there from all the way from 1 to 0? Um, OK. OK, right. Yeah, there is. OK. Now, I can do the gluing, obviously, only if I have many copies of the same item. Now, can I have many copies of a very large item? So if you have an item with size one-third, you couldn't have terribly many copies in the same pattern. So this trick essentially applies only to items that are reasonably small. So they should be, they should have a size of at most one over polylog n. Um, but essentially, I'm a, yeah, but I'm applying this for all the, those small items. OK. It wasn't quite my question, but this is interesting nevertheless. Uh, what I was asking is about the matrix, the rows in the matrix. They include all the items, right? All the way from, like, item of size third is going to be somewhere at the top of the matrix, right? Yes, yes. OK. Yes. Yeah. OK. Now, OK, um, it's a little technical detail. Just uh, let's assume that the, the fractional entries there are not too tiny, so they are at least one over poly log n. This is not difficult to get. OK. Now, OK. Uh, what I actually, what I want to have is what's written here that uh, in every individual, if you look at it in an individual pattern, then the number of copies of some item should only be a very, very small fraction of the number of copies that I, I have uh, in total of that item. OK. And I hope you can see that if this is satisfied for a small epsilon, then this ratio of infinity norm over one norm is going to be small. It's going to be at most epsilon. OK. OK, if I can get this, then uh, my algorithm will actually beat Kama OK. But, uh, well, it might not be satisfied. So let's see what we're going to do then. Now, the first step is that you do a little bit of grouping, very similar to what Kamak and Karp did. It's, it's really not difficult. It's just uh, you want that for every, for every item type, either you don't have any copy or you have copies so that the total size is at least some epsilon, which is of order 1 over polylog. Um, so you do, you do some, some the usual grouping as in Kamak and Carp, essentially. You get some tiny error for that. OK, not a big thing. And now, OK, and now you check, OK, in which pattern, in, in which, um, which of my patterns and for which item type is my condition violated? So where do I have too many copies in which pattern? And yeah, this is what, what you see in, what you see in red here. So these are the guys where I have problems, and these are the guys that would cause this, um, the ratio of infinity norm over one norm to be too large. And now I just apply the glue, this gluing trick as I did before. And now they are, some, some, they, are, they, are they are glued together to large items. OK. Um, and it's actually not so, 
I mean, if you do a little bit of calculus, then you see very quickly that the items that are glued together, they will have size at least 1 over, actually 1 over polylog n. So it's not, it doesn't happen that I glue the same item several times. Once I glue it, it has size at least 1 over polylog n, and then I forget about it. OK. OK. And then, well, OK. Now, now obviously, I do not have many copies left of items. But on the other hand, also, the number of total copies that I have from every item might have changed. So this ratio might still not be nice. I might need to repeat this step, but I cannot repeat it more than log n times, as each time the number of items that I was considering goes uh, down to at least half. So okay. this is a little technical, but it's not, not really difficult, actually. Now, the only message is that I can apply this gluing globally to my whole instance, and it costs me only a tiny, tiny fraction. Something actually sub, sub constant. I can make it 1 over polylog. I can make the cost 1 over polylog for every polylog that I like. OK. Good. Now, um, now we actually have everything together for the complete algorithm. I did show you an. In an algorithm at the beginning that was not com that was not complete. So I need to to add one or two uh, two things. So well, we still start the algorithm by computing fraction solution x, and then again we have log n iterations. However, at the beginning of every iteration, we need to massage our our instance a little bit before we can apply the Lovett-Mika algorithm. And the massaging is essentially that first I need to tiny bit round the, the fractional vector a little bit. And then I can uh, apply this gluing trick. And then I can apply the lovett -Mika. OK. And um, OK. If you, now, if you now start accounting how costly is your solution going to be, um, then you can do that as follows. You can, you can look at all your size classes. And you remember we have like log n size classes. In one size class, we have items that, that have a size within a factor of 2. And let's, let's charge the cost whenever it appears to the size class where it appears. And let's see how costly uh, our solution is going to be. Now, uh, we argued already that, I mean, we can always um, get one iteration for one size class at cost a constant. This is already what Kamak and Karp did, so we are never going to be more costly than that. However, for the small items, and small means smaller than 1 over polylog n, we can additionally apply this gluing trick, which brings this standard deviation for Lovett Mika down. And then we actually we pay something much, much less. So what we pay for a small size class in one iteration is one over polylog, and we can make this polylog as small as we like. Um, OK. And now if you sum this up, then you see that actually the error term is dominated by the remaining large items. But the trick is how many classes of large items do I have? Well, I have only log log n many. It means in every iteration, in every of my log n iterations, I pay only log log n instead of paying log n. And that's, that's how we get the approximation ratio. So I have a question. So you said before, so I asked about, do you ever go outside your uh, LP solution? But it seems that you don't. Like right? If you start finding a fractional LP solution x, then everything you do is going to stay inside the same support. So Oh. Yeah, right, right. OK. Now, what this gluing does is, well, you have, you have a pattern, and you have many copies of a small item. You glue them together, and yeah, what this essentially means is that, the, OK, then these small items, they become one large item. And it essentially means that you also consider patterns where, uh, where small items, where copies of many small items are replaced by one large item. 
So it's kind of you do generate new patterns, but they're actually very close to the ones that were already in the support. So we are very limited in, in how we create new patterns. Yeah. I guess one benefit is that then you can use this large bucket to put into it smaller items, but you must have been larger than the original to preclude them. Is this the way you use it? Um, OK. Essentially, what we're doing is we're combining the gluing and this mapping. So what essentially you could either, either what you could have is you could end up, OK, you might have a slot for a very large item. Uh, and you, you might put small, co co you might put many small items into it. Or it could go the other way around that you have a, a slot for, for, for many, for, for small items that you glue together and you put a large item into that. Both could happen. Okay. But you only map uh, kind of smaller items to, the mapping is only from smaller to, to larger ones. So it will not happen that you kind of you violate any, any, any size bar. Another question, do you know any limitations to this type of technique where you start with a fractional solution and you massage it in the, in the way that you do by gluing items? Do you know any limitation to how close this can be to opt? Yeah, so if you, if you look at instances where all the items have size strictly larger than a quarter, then this is actually very closely related to the discrepancy of three permutations. And there is an example by uh, Newman and Nikolov showing that actually there a log n discrepancy is necessary. Okay, so very, first of all, if all your items have size bigger than a quarter, then this gluing approach makes no sense because you're never going to have many copies of the same item. So I don't think that you can do anything. And if you only kind of map uh, map smaller items to slots of larger items, then you cannot beat the log n. Then you cannot beat log n. Because you can, you can if, if you have only such kind of a mapping, you could reduce uh, finding discrepancies of permutations to that case. I see. Do so you think that probably this log log n could be eliminated somehow? The log log n might not be necessary, yes. So it might, you might look carefully into this and it might be possible to eliminate the log n. This is correct. But if you want to beat the log n, you have to come up with something completely new. I'm a bit confused because if I remember correctly, Shachar, you can correct me, but it, in the uh, Lovett Mecca or in the Spencer thing, you don't lose that log n, right, when you iterate, you, because the, the problem that you left with, now you only have half of the, half of the, uh, you know, types to worry about, and, and, and then you actually, it, it, like, have a converging sum, you don't have to pay log n times log log n. Um, actually, for Spencer's bound, you do not lose the log n or the, the root log n, because there you have a nicely convergent sum, However, in this case of packing, you do not have a convergent sum. Because essentially, in every iteration, you pay a constant error if you have only items, let's say, in one size class. But you, you kind of you always pay the same constant. So the, the constant is not getting better. So you don't have conversion. But, so do you think that, for example, if this was a problem, because it seems that you know, your patterns are very sparse, so it seems similar to the back fiala. Setup. So, for example, there's the result of Bernard's check, who's not, algor not algorithmic, but get a root log. So, but he said maybe the bottom neck here is some, something else coming for the, the permutation. Uh, right, right. Um, yeah, I know, I know the result of Banachik. It's, but I have not been able to apply this here. So, I'm not exactly sh sure whether this is kind of the, like the right framework. But you're right. We we have some kind of sparse vectors. I mean, this is this is essentially what you're using. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Another question is: Is it possible to get some kind of control over 
So right now you say that about half the coordinates are integral after one round, after one iteration. Yes. Uh, is it possible to get some control over what are the sizes involved in those patterns? So if you want to say that some patterns involving sizes at least uh, s are you know, become integral, so then you might be able to analyze the sum a little better instead of having the same. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, controlling which which are the variables that are getting into that are getting integral. This is a very interesting question. Uh, maybe Shahar can can say more about that. But I I don't. Yeah. yeah so the initially there was this. Uh, this uh, non-contractive entropy method, and that, that was really a black box. It didn't tell you anything about what are the coordinates that are getting integral, or what are the elements that you're going to color. However, for the Lovett Maker algorithm, you have a Brownian motion, and you might be able to control better where this is going to end up. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe Shaha is uh, probably the expert, so you can. No, so actually, my intuition is the opposite. It might be because you have constraints coming from uh, assets, they might restrict some of the movements. So, for example, you have two rows, it has only one element where they differ, then somehow if you hit both of them, then this variable will never change again. So, somehow the weight is now both in Bansal's algorithm, our algorithm, you might get bad. You can't really control which variables are, 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 are have enough of entropy in them. Um. So, uh, are there more questions? I, I actually I have my, my two open questions, so I could go on with asking that. Okay. Um, well, the, first of all, the obvious question is where is the where is the additive integrality gap of this LP really? Um, it could be constant. It could be log n times log log n. Um, everything in between is actually possible. So. It, and it's, it's not so clear to me where it is ended up. So there's, there is a conjecture by a couple of people saying that the, integra the additive integrality gap, you should get it by computing the LP, rounding it up, and adding one. And this should be at most the optimum. But it's not so clear to me. I, I don't see much evidence for that. So my second open question would be that um, this would the Kama, the Kama kind cup algorithm, it uses the Goodall trick of computing a basic solution. There are hundreds of papers out there, especially in approximation algorithms, who use this trick. And now it seems that there is a more powerful technique uh, by Laban and Meka and, and also by, by Bansal and Beck and others. And I'm really wondering whether there are more applications out there. I mean, it would be strange if bin packing is the only problem with this giving you anything. Uh, and there are actually also there are also other strong techniques in this uh, in discrepancy theory. It's actually the the result of Balashtik uh, that was already mentioned by by Shaha. Um, yeah, and I'm really wondering whether there are more applications for this kind of techniques. And, uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's it from my side, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. So we had a lot of questions. Are there any more questions? Also, if anyone wants to join the Hangout now, you can ask for it um, on the TCS Plus page. We send you a link. OK. Do we have any questions? I have actually one more question. If you can go a few slides, like one, two slides back. So here, this one. So what you're saying is that if all the item sizes are small, smaller than one of the log n, then you get a better guarantee, right? Is this correct? Ah, oh, wait, wait. This is, one has to be a little careful. If initially they are smaller than one over poly log n, uh, then in the first iterations, maybe you're not making a mistake, but at some point you might glue them together, and then you will get an item which is large, even if it was not there initially. Okay, so this refers to 
yeah, to the size classes, but they, they are kind of the dynamic. The size classes are kind of dynamic, right? You might have items that are initially small, and then they are kind of large la later. It, it's, it's kind of, it's a, it's a little bit strange, because the items, as long as they are small, they create essentially a negligible error. This is the, the message, yes. But they, they will not stay uh, small forever. That's the bottom. More questions? All right. Well, if there's no more questions, so uh, we can thank Thomas again. <laughs> But thanks a lot for the talk. Thanks. Thanks, um, thanks everyone for joining in. We'll see you in uh, see you in three weeks. Uh, Jelani Nelson will be giving the next TCS Plus talk the week right after stock. Okay. Um, I guess I can take it off air now. <laughs> <laughs>